private equity to a to a greater extent is still pretty correlated to public markets. I think when you look at venture, it's much less correlated to the public markets and also therefore much less correlated to, to a private equity. And it's very hard to pinpoint what it's correlated to. Supercluster's is the podcast to demystify the secrets, stories, and tactics behind the money that moves the venture capital world. Welcome back. Today we have Yop Versendorp. And Yop is the managing partner at MarketLink Capital, and that's market without the letter E. M-A-R-K-T-L-I-N-K Capital. You might be familiar with Yop's prolific 2023 writings on Medium, my favorite of which is why to and why not to invest in the fund of funds piece back in August of last year. MarketLink Capital has also deployed over 700 million euros across 50 funds in Europe and in the US, with an LP base of over 1,000 investors from entrepreneurs to family offices to individuals. Prior to MarketLink, Yap was a junior partner at McKinsey, leading their European VC practice. He's also been a serial founder, which is, I guarantee you, something we will cover. Um, and if you're an athlete or if you like clothing and attire and fashion, um, this is where to go. Um, we'll cover the first portion on that. Um, on top of that, we will talk about portfolio construction, the three kinds of emerging managers that exist, numbers behind why the European venture ecosystem is fascinating, and much, much more. So without further ado, Yap, welcome to the show. Thanks. So last time we chatted, I'm going to be honest, I stole you away from the wonderful adventures of Peter Pan. Um, so <laughs> this time around... <laughs> It, it, it's such a great like movie as well. I, I like because of you that weekend. I ended up watching Peter Pan again because I was like, oh, you know what? I I haven't tuned into the wonderful animated movies in a long time, and I love the feel good movies. And Peter Pan just happens to be one of those great kind of like inspiring movies to watch. Um, so thank you for the inspiration there. Um, and the wonderful thing is, Yap, you are across the world from me right now, and, and one of the greatest parts of having these conversations digitally and virtually is that while I'm still a work in progress for the show, um, I don't have to validate parking. Um, and one day I'll make sure I'll get your coat check. But as of now, like in season two, we'll keep this virtual and keep things lean and light. But until then, I'm excited for this next hour and we can dive straight into it. And so there are a lot of places we can start with. And I say that a lot because in in doing homework for our, our conversations in general, I end up finding a lot of very interesting things. And so I'm going to invoke a name. And Yap, I want you to take it where you think it makes sense. What is the significance of Mount Pinatubo? Um, and how has that changed your trajectory and maybe like in being a founder, being entrepreneurial? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's taken me back a couple of years, Mount Pinatubo. I also don't know exactly how to pronounce it. But it was um, back... Um, over five years ago, six years ago, I think, when I was doing my MBA. And I was doing my MBA at INSEAD. Uh, it's, a, it's a business school that is campuses both in uh, Fontainebleau, close to Paris, and, and in Singapore. And I happened to be in the Singapore campus. And to be completely honest with you, I didn't like it as much. No uh, uh, MBA experience. <laughs> They're not going to come uh, come back to you for like you know alumni speaking or alumni um, alumni donations. I don't, I don't I don't think they will. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the complete honest answer to it is that uh, back then I was working at McKinsey, uh, already doing a lot of work in the technology and the venture capital sector. Um, <clears throat> but they offered it free of charge, and I told them I'm just going to take it. And then I sat in the classroom first day of lectures. Uh, and then the lights went out and somebody pulled up a PowerPoint presentation and then everybody got out his notebooks. And I thought, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> this is what it's going to be for next year. I really hadn't thought through that decision well. And, uh, and instead of doing a, a lot of these lectures, I started traveling Southeast Asia a lot and doing what I love doing, and that is sports. And uh, along those travels, I also got to uh, Mount Pinatubo. Um, but because I only, I live in Amsterdam, from back then I lived in Amsterdam, I only packed like the bare essentials to move out to Singapore. Um, and I was doing a lot of different sports like sailing and mountain climbing and, uh, and all kinds of, uh, of different, uh, different disciplines. It struck me as all that for every, every single discipline, you need a different jacket 
And so I thought it might make sense instead of putting my hours in, into learning more about Econ 101 or about uh, making financial models, I make a jacket instead. And, that, and that's what I spend most of my year at INSEAD doing. So finding fabrics and, and membranes uh, and putting them together and see how well they performed uh, in endurance tests. It's probably not the most uh, academic way to spend a, a year at, uh, at INSEAD, but for, for me it worked out well. It was a, it was a hell of a time. Because and I will give some context for those listeners who are unfamiliar with the name INSEAD. It is by far one of the best business schools in the world. And so um, I saw those eyebrows go up. So for listeners who are not <laughs> watching this on video, uh, I'm paying attention to Yop. Every, uh, yops every movement but uh, it is it is a phenomenal business school and most people who who go to it end up going off and doing amazing things and i will say given the entrepreneurial gene in which you have um application is probably the best way i mean i went to berkeley and oftentimes our professors like hey get out in the field don't stay in the classroom because the best way to learn about building something is not through a lecture hall or powerpoint and all that it's actually doing something talking to customers and actually building something and in your case i think you took that education in stride and did wonderful things with that. Yeah, it was fun. I always wanted to build a physical product. I'm also always a little bit jealous of people who do. Uh, and and uh, learn the hard way, it's very hard. <laughs> it is very hard. Really um, so uh, business-wise, it wasn't a great success. But I think... Um, and I, in all honesty, it wasn't also set up in that way, right? It was, mm -hmm. I developed it as a jacket for myself um, and to prove to myself that I could develop a better jacket than any commercial jacket in the market, uh, which for outdoor gear is actually quite easy to measure. Huh? Because you, you say, what is the weight of something? What is the strength? What is the water resistance? What is the wind resistance? And you can measure that in the lab. And I just wanted to prove that I could also do it myself, but also to make it for myself, to do support for it. And then while I was doing that, more and more people came along who said, if you're going to make the jacket for yourself, make it for me as well. And then it sort of evolved into a Pixar campaign and delivering some jackets. But, uh, I, I guess it was never the intention to make it a full, full blown uh, enterprise. I love it. Um, we may see some of these jackets pop up in eBay. and be struck at thousands of dollars just because it's limited time edition so to speak um, and worn by these professional athletes and olympians as well um okay um to switch gears just a little bit when i look at kind of your life i see the theme of entrepreneurship pop up again and again um not only with your kickstarter um but also with you know, you're building an educational company as well. And obviously, then you started Welt Ventures, which, you know, um, combined to be market link capital. I'm really curious on the beginnings, because if I did my homework correctly, and once again, feel free to correct me, um, both of your brothers come from a legal background. And in the process of growing up, what did that conversation look like? Because I kind of look at your resume per se, and I look at your brother's resume, they're I can see the correlation between those two, but at the same time, um, you've taken a very different path altogether. So what was the early upbringing like where it made you choose the path of entrepreneurship? That's a, it's a really good question. Uh, I, I don't often think about this. Um, so I come from a, uh, a, which is probably something you haven't come across, but my grandfather was actually a really good entrepreneur here in the Netherlands. So he built a, fairly big business in crane construction and heavy lifting uh, uh, in the heavy lifting space. <clears throat> its claim to fame once was that this company was asked by Putin to lift a Russian uh, submarine Kursk, which sank. I don't know if you know this. Like, this is I know I do not know this. Do educate me. So I, I think it's about, I don't know, it's over 15 years ago that the uh, Russian uh, Marine Mm -hmm. They lost a submarine that sank, but it was a nuclear submarine. It was at the at the at the depths of the Barents Sea, um, and and nobody could pick it up because it's very difficult. Yeah, it's a very technical job, uh, and and so those are the, uh, the type of jobs that the company did that my grandfather built, and so it was taken over by my uncle who ran it for some time, and then eventually got sold. But I think through that company, which is called Mammut, I think some of that. 
that entrepreneurial DNA must have slipped through to me, but also to my brothers who, uh, one of them, both, we all started uh, studying law. It's probably mm-hmm. due to my mom who was a professor in law. And uh, it was definitely the both uh, at my, uh, <laughs> at, <laughs> when growing up. And, uh, but they all both also started their own company. So one is its own uh, law firm. And the other one is its own uh, public affairs uh, firm. Yeah. I remember, I, I think you did civil law back in school as well. Um, and there, there's a whole journey there. I want to touch on your grandfather for a second. You said genetically, maybe you got more of your grandfather's genes than maybe your brothers did. But were there, like, I do believe in a lot of like nature versus nurture, but like there's a lot of nurture that comes to it. Did you spend an outsized amount of time with your grandfather or listening to your grandfather's stories? Is that why you were more inspired to start things, at least on the, the entrepreneurial side? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, uh, to be completely honest, the relationship wasn't always that good uh, uh, at all. And I don't think I have more entrepreneurial DNA than my brothers necessarily. I just think that um, there is some, there might be, and this is always a discussion, right? This might be the nature element to why I ended up doing, doing some entrepreneurial things and why my brothers did as well. I think the other element, and that's, that's probably more, more nurture is that we were always raised by um, asking ourselves the questions: How can you do better? Right? Mm. I come from a from from a family where if you got a B in school, they would always ask, "That's great, but why isn't it A?" And I think if you look at the world <laughs> in that way, that you come up with, with ways of doing things differently, and right. that eventually yeah. lead to leads to entrepreneurship in a way, or 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 not, but in our case, it did. And uh, and I think it's more driven always by ideation mm-hmm. than it is, as some people have, by determination to do their own thing. I don't think it was that necessarily for me. It's just that sometimes I feel, or I think uh, more precisely, that, that there was a better way of doing stuff, like making a jacket or starting an educational technology platform or... Uh, creating a, a, an asset manager as, as we're doing right now. That makes a lot of sense. There's um, a lot to be said on the the way you think about the world, but also like not accepting the status quo. Um, and wonderful institutions obviously teach that and preach that. But at the same time, if that is a part of your upbringing growing up, it makes a lot of sense in the sense that you look at something, you don't accept it for its face value. And you're like, well, if I'm going to spend a lot of time with this object, with this topic, with this sport, um, let's make it the best version it can be. And sometimes it leads to adventures where you make your own jacket. Exactly. I think that's very right. I think that, 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 is, that is explaining it in, uh, in a perfect way. So I want to pivot the conversation into the world of LPs, fund to funds, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, when, when you first started Welt, I'm actually really curious. Um, You publicly said that you and your partner, and forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation here, Buk, 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 Buka? Bauke. I'm totally off. Okay. Bauk, Bauk, Bauka. Yeah, Bauka. Uh, So Bauka is spelled... Don't don't feel ashamed. It's a very Dutch thing. I should have asked you this in the pre-chat, but whatever. This is going to make it into the actual show and people can see me fumble and and all that. Um, but for, for for those listeners, Bauka is spelled B O U K E. Um, so Bauka, you and Bauka gave yourself a maximum of one year post McKinsey to go from being a consultant and I quote successful on uh, successful investor. And I freaking love this. And not to and we mentioned this in the pre chat, but not to sound like a fortune cookie. But I do believe that constraints are the breeding grounds of genius. Um, so I'm curious for both you and Bauka. Um, who were both instrumental in starting McKinsey's European VC arm, why leave and why give yourself only a year? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, which I can only answer with a sort of long, longer answer. So I hope that's okay. Hey, we got time. We got time. Um, so, so Bauk and I at McKinsey were running a uh, program that was called Fuel. And that was basically the McKinsey practice for startups, unicorns, and venture capital funds. And it was going very well, uh, but Bauk and I were both 
uh, coming to that age where we were both becoming partners or getting into the partner trajectory. And for that, we had to do a lot of research. And uh, we got one and a half year to do that research. And it was a three piece type of research. The first part was on the top thousand companies in technology that were founded since 2000. Second piece was on the top VC funds in Europe. And the third one was on the top LPs in Europe. And we published the first one together with World Economic Forum. And then this, on the second one, I looked at the article and I, I said to Bob, it is more of a thesis for a fund of funds. Why don't we quit McKinsey and do that? <laughs> and uh, Bauk looked at me and said, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's exactly the right way to progress. And so we quit our jobs at McKinsey, but uh, at McKinsey he said, what are we going to do? Why, why are we leaving? This is the worst moment to leave, you know? There's, there's loads of money in your future here. <laughs> right. And to timestamp this for our leave. listeners, could you, could you mention like what, what year this was, what year marking, where this all happened, when this all happened? This, I think 2020, 2021 or something. So hectic time. So McKinsey's looking at you and like, why, why would you, why yeah, would you do this in a crazy it? world? Exactly. You're, you're well positioned to, 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 to uh, make a career here. And then, then we explained what we were going to do. And I said, okay, but that actually makes a lot of sense. Do you want to explore running that ID for us, right? For, for maybe McKinsey. Uh, and so we spent some more time at McKinsey co-developing that ID to some extent. Uh, until eventually we thought, yeah, if it's good enough for McKinsey, it's probably <laughs> also good enough to do that as well. And that's when we, uh, when we were on our own, so to say. Um, but at the same time, we, we thought we need to be realistic about what, what we're going to achieve here and set ourselves a goal, both in terms of time and also in terms of what we want to achieve in, 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 uh, in fundraising and in getting the right funds to uh, to allow us to invest. And, and so we were very, I think, goal-driven from the beginning to, to set our targets quite straight. So publicly, you mentioned that you gave us, you gave your, you and Bauka a year to become a successful investor, right? To pivot from consultant to a successful investor. In your mind, what did success mean? Was it a certain target raised? Was it like a certain amount of deployed? Like what were you looking, how were you, defi- how were you desi- defining success in terms of a KPI, key performance indicator per se? I think, I think we wanted to have raised our first fund mm-hmm. and, and, and partially deployed it. I think we wanted to have expanded into private equity as well. So we started off with a venture fund of funds. I think there was a second one. And I think thirdly, we wanted to have a, a very engaged and different type of setup of LPs. So mm-hmm. we wanted to have entrepreneurs only, want to have people who could add value, who understand what we did, and want to make a very close-knit community. And I think those three, so fundraising, really good funds, really good LP base, those were the three things we sort of measured ourselves by. But in, in all honesty, and I've, I've noticed this across many different things, it's also sometimes success is also just a feeling. Uh, without something too touch feeling. And, and sometimes you notice that there's traction, right? You almost, it's almost a buzz in the air. Yeah. And in the beginning, it's sometimes really hard to find. And then at some point it is there and then, and then it keeps on going and it keeps on expanding and then it becomes more of a game of controlling it in the right way, finding the right people. But if, I think in the beginning, yeah, it, it, uh, we, we had a, a couple of very concrete, uh, goals, but I think it was more of the feeling when it, we have the first uh, first couple of milestones achieved, and we see that the bus is there. I think that was that was something that we said. And I think this was after nine months or so that we said this is this is something different. And to make it more concrete, and let me know if I'm putting words in your mouth, Yap. Um, I imagine it you're starting to feel the pull of the market instead of pushing against the market. Instead of going, like, "Hey, would this be a good idea? Would you back us?" kind of thing. You're starting to feel people like organically come to you and tell you, "Hey, this is such a great idea. Like, how do I get my friends involved? How do I get involved? How do I get my families involved?" and all that. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, I mean, it's like you found effective like product market fit, right? And maybe it's like the Sean Ellis question of how disappointed would you be if we took this product away from you? Very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, you know, not disappointed. Forty percent or more say very disappointed, so to speak. Um, so it could be that as well. Um, I'm curious on that 
front when it comes to kind of just like, you know, building a community. And I want to touch on the community aspect of it as well, because too often I hear in the world of venture, LP, founder, they say, we got a community. And often just is a Slack channel or a Discord channel. It's, a, it's an amorphous term, a nebulous term in a lot of ways. How did how did you and Bauka think about community? Like, was there a certain thing you were looking for, a certain sign you were looking for to determine, like, we have a community and not just a list of individuals? Yeah, I, I think we set out to achieve three things with community, right? I think we wanted people to have fun with each other. I mean, when entrepreneurs meet entrepreneurs, good stuff happens even if you don't bring any content. Mm -hmm. Second part is we want to bring the absolute best type of propositions. Mm -hmm. So in terms of sales, right? It being sales almost without being sales, right? Where you offer something that people really want. And the third thing is organized knowledge in a way that nobody does. So one of the, to give you an example of, of all three, in, on the element of fun, we bring we have over a thousand LPs now. I think we bring the majority of them to the Formula One in the Netherlands. Holy cow! We, yeah. How can <laughs> I be an LP? Can I can I can I join? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I personally do not care too much about Formula One, but we have a Dutch uh, race car driver called uh, Max Verstappen who always wins, and so that tends to uh, cause a good atmosphere. On the, on the second one, I think both our private equity and the venture capital side, we've been very targeted in what we do and what we don't do. And I think it's something that there was very little uh, access to in Europe and in the Netherlands specifically, so that there's a lot of pull instead of push, like you said. Mm -hmm. And on the third thing, we organize um, knowledge event, like, for instance, last week we did something which is called The World in 2024 which is based on what The Economist does, right? End of the year, they often publish a magazine where they look ahead in, into the year to come. And we ask both on the technological front, on the economics front, and the geopolitical fronts, um, I don't know, a couple of the most esteemed speakers to say something about what they expect, right? Where do interest rates, and where are they going this year? Will, will inflation finally be reduced? Will, uh, <laughs> That's the question of the day. Taiwan? <laughs> <laughs> the world, the Trump in the elections in the, in the US, which is sort of a, a Trump card. Does that makes sense. Because <laughs> it, uh, it's such an important factor, I, I think, for, for, for everyone. Nobody knows. Oh, yeah. yeah so we tried, to, we tried to build the community around those three angles. And one of the things we did very early on is we partnered with a firm called Marketing, which also now gives, uh, gives its name to our company. Which is one of the biggest M and A brokers in the Benelux, and so they have they on an on an average year they sell or buy about a hundred companies, and so they had a big network of mainly Dutch entrepreneurs that we could tap into. So that definitely um, kickstarted the whole investor community building exercise. There's a lot of magic to be said about cross partnerships, cross pollination. In, a way, in many ways, I'm almost look. I'm thinking about the meme where like there are three Spider Mans pointing at each other, going like, "Oh, I know you, I know you," kind of thing. Like, I feel like that's the early signs of like recognition across multiple universes, multiverses, so to speak. Um, on on the front of events, you mentioned you organize events, well, for organized knowledge. Um, how often do these events happen, and is there a certain cadence in which you have in mind? that either your community is asking for or that you found to be the best fit for not only your time, but also the demand from the market and your LP base? So we do a shitload of, 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 of events. <laughs> we do like two, three <laughs> events a month. Holy cow. Like literally, yeah. So we, do, we, have, we have a full time, like we have two, almost three people who only do events. So uh -huh. The only thing they do is events. Wow. And so we do events when we have a certain fund in the market, or we do an event when we have a certain topic that we find interesting, or we have an event because we want to do rally racing together, or we want to do a golf tournament. So I, I, I think about <laughs> every month there's two, two, at least two events. Uh, or we go we're going skiing together. It's really built around that community. You mentioned that 90% of your LPs are Dutch. And I'm curious, and you have like over a thousand investors and I have a multitude of questions going on through my head right now, because in the U S 
think if you raise a fund less than $10 million, you can have 249 accredited investors. If you raise like uh, more than uh, kind of $10 million, only 99 accredited investors, but you can have up to like 2000 QPs in a given fund. When you have a thousand over a thousand investors, I believe across three funds, um, um, how how do you f- think about LP construction? Is there are, are there special? I mean, I'm learning here, but are there special European laws that allows for multiple people to participate in a fund, or did you structure it interestingly in a way that it can accept a thousand investors? So we have a thousand individual investors across a multitude of funds. So we have. Fund okay. funds, more on the private equity side and the, and the venture side. Mm-hmm. And then we have individual feeder funds for people who just want to invest into one fund. Gotcha. Uh, Is there a cap on, on the number of LPs you can bring in in Europe? No, there's not a cap on the number of LPs, or, or at least not that I'm aware of. So we're not, not reaching that cap. But there is a minimum that people need to invest to be deemed a, a professional investor for That's the fair. Dutch regulatory agency. And that is 100K. And for us, the minimum investment size is 250K. Mm-hmm. So by uh, taking that to 250K, it becomes possible for, for our retail investors to invest in the, into the funds. And so just to be 100% clear, we only have individual investors. So we don't have pension funds as of now. We do have, have like many of the largest family offices uh, in the Netherlands and also uh, Abroad, but we don't do any pension funds, endowments, sovereigns, that kind of um, people. Yeah. And that's also why we set out to do what we do. It's to give entrepreneurs and individuals access to an asset class that uh, a lot of people uh, <laughs> aforementioned, like the sovereign wealth funds and stuff, or, or yeah. That makes it. Was that the pitch to them? Because you've had. Like, as, as we mentioned so far, a multitude of individual investors, including folks like the founders of Crisp, HelloFresh, Ticket Swap, and more. Like, was that the pitch to them? Like, I'm going to give you access to an asset class that traditionally you typically don't have access to? Or like, what, what pitch resonated with them for them to say yes? I think that is exactly the pitch. So um, when you look at portfolio uh, allocation, right? Or, or when you look at... Uh, uh, when you look at how to how to invest your wealth and investing like the best, you see that there is an allocation to venture capital that makes sense, and an allocation to private equity that makes sense. But it's very hard to do on your own. Mm-hmm. Not just because best funds don't want you as an investor, but also it's very hard to see what the best funds are. Yeah. And so part of the pitch was, we're going to take this out of your hands. You have to trust us to find the best funds. Uh, but instead of uh, trying to do this yourself, team up with a team that can find you the best. I think that was that was definitely part of it. I'm curious as you're as you've talked to so many individuals who've become LPs in your funds who want access to venture capital. And I often say, like for individuals and in smaller family offices, venture is less of an asset class, but it's more as an access class because they don't know where to go find these company uh, the, these firms. Um, what do you typically see in terms of allocation models for individuals? Like how much what percent of their portfolio do individuals, in your opinion, of what you've seen, typically put into venture and private equity? I think what we see across the board is that um, people will invest about 30% of their wealth into private markets, so private mm-hmm. equity and venture. And then within private equity and venture, they do about 70 30, again, into buyout versus venture. And then growth is somewhat mixed across the two. Um, so I think that's that's typically what we see, but there's a lot of different uh, different flavors to it. I think young people tend to do a little bit more venture. People who have been successful in venture tend to do a lot more venture. <laughs> a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah, and I think um, uh, the more uh, sort of mom and pop shop you get, the more the more private equity becomes attractive. Yeah. And, and we truly believe, and that's why we do both, that it's the combination that creates a lot of success. Yeah. I mean, venture and private equity are, are pretty uncorrelated asset classes, which is phenomenal. Well, actually, can you, can, can you dive deeper on that, that section? Sorry? Can you dive deeper on like why venture and private equity are uncorrelated for kind of the emerging LP in our audience? Yeah, sure. So I think what we're seeing in the data, and I think this is not... Uh, a very proprietary knowledge, I think a lot of people see that, is that private equity 
to a to a greater extent is still pretty correlated to public markets. And so there is certainly a delay, and it's certainly less volatile. And on average, you you do get more alpha, I think, in private equity, especially if you go more to lower mid market. But it's still pretty correlated with public markets. I think when you look at venture, it's much less correlated with public markets, and also therefore much less correlated with, with private equity. And it's very hard to pinpoint what it's correlated to. <laughs> it certainly has an influence of interest rates, but it's also very much influenced, I think, with technological booms, right? So um, introduction of the iPhone, introduction of cloud technology, potentially introduction of uh, AI technology, or, or at least the, the, um, the boom of AI technology that we're experiencing now. Very much too early to say, but it could, it could be. And by combining different asset classes that are both very um, high yield, but very uncorrelated, you don't only up the, um, the average return that you're going to get, but you're also lowering a little bit of the risk and the standard deviation of your portfolio. I think that's why we set out to revolt. Gotcha. When you say that venture is, uh, you know, like the, the, the optimum is like 70-30, uh, like buyout to venture, is there is there data that informs this? I, I've also talked to multiple LPs who have that similar distribution when it comes to buyout versus uh, venture. Like, is is there math or data that sh- like proves that hey, you know, this this is why it's the optimum? Is it largely just because a check sizes into private equity or like buyout versus venture, or is it are there other reasons? I think there are many reasons to be honest. I think one of the one of the biggest reasons is that buyout scales well, uh-huh. right? It, to, to some extent, uh, and, and not talking large caps. I think buyout is much easier to scale than a venture firm, which basically means that venture stays small. Mm-hmm. So you need to, especially if you're building a fund of fund or you're building your own portfolio, you have to stitch a lot of funds together to nitty gritty work. So you want to do less of that in your big buyout tickets. So one of the very clear patterns why, why this has grown the way it has grown is that it, uh, it's just more cumbersome. Yeah. I think a, a second reason, um, uh, that we're seeing this in the market is that it's indeed what, uh, where sort of the optimum lies. And if you say, is there data to prove it? I think there's banks that have run these analyses, like UBS publishes something on, on this, in this regard. We do our own analysis. Um, but I think it's, it, the model is still to be evolved, right? I think it's only since the 70s, 80s that we saw institutions commit large sums of money to private equity and venture funds. Um, and if you look at a lot of the endowments in the US where you are from, I think there are over 50% allocation to venture. Yeah. So I don't know what the world will look like in 10 years from now. But if you make the Goldman Sachs Family Office report, they will tell you that uh, I think about uh, 8 or 9% of, 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 of wealth, these family offices, of these largest family offices in the world goes into venture. Then eight or nine percent into growth, and then eight or eight or nine percent into into private into into buyout. If you take growth and buyout together as, as meaning private equity, it means somewhat of a two third one third split, right? Right. So, so I think it's both informed by practicalities and realities, as much as like what is the optimal uh, split. This might be a more of a whiplash of a of a question to be fair uh but in july of 2022 um you mentioned in an article about wealth uh wealth ventures that you invest in funds in three different stages seed early stage pre-ipo um and when we last chatted you mentioned that you plan to invest in about 10 to 15 funds which is a very concentrated portfolio 80 percent established 20 percent emerging um but most interestingly, and largely because I'm Americana, um, uh, you you plan to put in like sixty to seventy five percent into European funds. How did you come up with that portfolio construction model? That's a very good question. Um, so what, there, when we did the research, we came across three things that we t- thought were interesting, right? Which which informed basically the strategy of how we wanted to do venture funds, a venture fund of funds. So this is less of the portfolio strategy for the private equity side or more for the venture side. The first one is that 85% of returns flow to 5% of the funds 
And then those 5% of the funds are very sticky. So we call that the Champions League effect, where funds that have performed well in the past tend to perform well in the future. Mm -hmm. It's really rare. Huh? If you look at a hedge fund, you see none of that. Yeah. But it's similar to the Champions League where, they, so we call it football in Europe. I think you guys call it soccer. But we're, I apologize for butchering it with a six-letter word that makes no sense to the rest of the world. <laughs> Um, and there's a competition between all the top European teams. And if you look at uh, the teams that competed 20 years ago, they're more or less the same teams that are competing today. Uh, and sure, there's like a 20% change. New, new teams have popped up that have performed very well. And there's teams that have been mismanaged or have somehow slipped, slipped through the cracks. But overall, we see that that is... Um, that it's fairly stable. So that was one. So we want to invest for a large amount into, for 80% into established, so those are 80, and then 20% in emerging because there's also always new kids on the block. And the second one is that when you take a longer term perspective to venture, US have outperformed Europe uh, by a landslide, right? So more technological success, more unicorns, more market cap realization, uh, so basically by every measure. But if you look under the hood of the actual venture returns, so not the technological success necessarily, but the venture returns, you see that for the last five to 10 years, European venture funds have actually outperformed US venture funds. Now, why is that the case? We believe that is the case because as is, as is the case with all types of investments, it's basically taking the, uh, the difference between entry point and exit point, mm -hmm. right? An exit point in the U.S. is much better than it is in Europe. Right. right. Um, We're talking about decacorns, unicorns, all yeah, that kind yeah. of yeah. yeah. But Europeans are, I think, much more capital efficient and also much more stingy in a way, right? We're more, yeah, more new to the ways of venture in a way. So we pay much less for seed stage startups. And so that delta creates a little bit of difference that at the end of the, at the end of the, at the end of the drive delivers more alpha to the venture funds. So I think we saw on average like a two, three percentage point difference. I mean, that's huge. Oh, wow. That's right? huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And, uh, and so we said we wanted to do uh, more into Europe and a little bit less into the US, but still we wanted to do US because they're, the U.S., a little bit the home of venture, has a lot of funds that we would like to invest in. And then thirdly, uh, uh, I think that's maybe the most controversial thing, because I think a lot of fund funds do this differently. We found that when you invest in venture, it actually matters. So it matters whether you invest in 2008 or 2001 or, or now, right, in 2024. And it matters significantly, it's significantly more than it matters into private equity. But as we've discussed before, it's very hard to pinpoint when is a good time. And why is it hard to pinpoint when it is a good time? It is fairly okay to judge when, when something is a good entry window, right? You could still have a theory about one, what could make, what could constitute a good entry window. High interest rates or valuations are low. Technological boom with the rise of AI. Right, that could provide for fertile grounds to start investing in venture. But the truth of the matter, when we look at the data, is that the entry point matters much less than the exit point. And because venture is about outliers, and outliers are created through IPOs, the exit window matters a lot. And to create a big enough exit window to let every vintage and then we create in the fund of fund world be a good vintage. We invest from pre-seed, that in pre-seed funds, right? That invest in companies that need to go to the stock market maybe in seven to eight years. So we pre-seed and seed, we call, we call seed. Then series A and series B, we call early stage. And then everything later in that we call growth. We also don't make a distinction between growth and late stage. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's everybody, everyone defines this differently. Yeah. Um, and so we, we pinpointed it to the series. Gotcha. And that's, that's how we adjust. And so the reference point, if I'm understanding this correctly, is the series A, series B, and both before and after shifts as a function of the market. Exactly. 
gotcha um yeah because the definition of uh, let's be honest like uh, i think this was a tweet we could probably pull it up somewhere i think andrew chen said this at andreason with that um like i think he said this in 2022 or 2023 but uh 2023 seed is uh the equivalent of like a 2016 series a or something like that i think it's the normalization of the market right i think it's yeah. it's and it's so i haven't been around that long but it's it's nothing that you haven't seen in 2001 i think i think but so it's just a it's just the waves of the market and for and to not ride the waves of the market too much we time diversify yeah it's consistent the the goal is consistency you've capped your downside and obviously uh, it's up to your strategy but if you've capped your downside you've obviously capped some of the upside because exactly. uncapping the upside would be like hey you're doing all seed funds but that would risk of ruin is much higher so to speak for that. Yeah, but there's something funny happens right okay tell and me so more venture by, by any mean is a funny industry but when we look at the data so imagine this let's take private equity and venture capital and put them opposite each other and, mm-hmm. and talk about the risk of divers- diversifying away your alpha that you that you uh, also see on the stock market or anywhere else uh-huh. i look at it as throwing a dice right if you throw a dice in private equity and the numbers on the dice represent the moic or the money multiple of the funds. It is it is pretty pretty much like a dice which which has a zero, right? Mm-hmm. So you get zero times your money one time, but it's basically capped at six x. Mm-hmm. We don't see a lot of private equity funds that do much more than six x. Sure, there are some lower and mid market, but as a rule of thumb, it's a one to, it's a zero to six distribution. Now, what happens if you throw that dice twenty times? It will average out. Right? That's true. Law of large numbers. So if you think you're a really good picker, you don't want to do too many because otherwise you just regress to the mean. Yeah. Now in venture, what we see is something which is a little bit odd. So it is a dice for sure, but it's a really old looking dice. (laughs) Because you also find funds that do 40 times uh, money or funds that do 80 times money. Right? So you you have a dice that is uh, structured in such a weird way that it actually makes sense to throw a couple of times, right? To make mm-hmm. sure that you have also <laughs> this outlier, outlier moik on your dice. And so what we have found in our research, and I think we cross-checked that with research of other more uh, iconic institutions than ours, is that if you go between 15 and 25 funds, that you that you basically really limit your your downside. Mm-hmm. So I think when we look at the data, if you go above nine funds, the chances of you doing a negative IR are over are already, I think, below one percent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you you still the average of the fund goes up. Right. Right. So the not not the not the not not the outlier returns that will diminish obviously, mm-hmm. but the, but the average will still go up, and that is something you don't see in a lot of different other asset classes. You might see it in crypto specifically. You might see it in some also other skewed um, asset classes, but you don't see it in, in private equity, for instance. And so that's why we do a, a, about fifteen to twenty-five funds a year. But 15 like more established funds and then more emerging ones mm-hmm. with smaller ticket size uh, because it actually makes sense to diversify not only from a risk point of view but also from a return point of view. If I'm understanding this right, for private equity, the mean and median are actually pretty close to each other. Ends up being like a 3x, 4x average kind of thing. Whereas in, in venture, the mean and median are actually quite different numbers. Exactly. Um, because we have... Ama- like, you know, the, 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 what what is it like? You have Chris Saka's fund, like lowercase capital fund one did like Twitter, Uber, Instagram. And I think I think also Stripe in that fund. And it was a 250x on, on, on money kind of thing. And you have other funds, you know, obviously outliers are outliers, right? But on average, you're probably expecting a little bit closer. Like you're probably underwriting probably a 3x, 5x, like 5x on a seed, 3x on a series A kind of fund, give or take. But you're expecting there, 
they're they're going a little. Oh, you're going oh, you're going higher. You're going higher. Okay, tell what is what is your underwriting? What is your underwriting for seed in Series A or seed in early stage? Now, just to go on that talk. Okay, so you see a lot of funds that have done over 100 x but are also smaller than 10 or 15 million, right? Yeah. And these are these are more to me. This is more. I wouldn't say it's uh, it's 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 more noise than signal oh, gotcha. because the chance of you finding that is is so rare. And we talked about luck before our fortune cookies, but it's like, <laughs> we get, it, it's it's a diff, it's not a game that we play, and it's not a game I would feel comfortable playing. Yeah. But you also find a lot of funds who have over twenty five x with a fifty to hundred million fund, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that is, and and often not the first fund they raise, or the second or the third fund they've done. Right. I think that is that is exceptional. That is something that is that is very still very rare but we see it and that's something that we that gets us very excited so is it accurate to say when you put like let's say 10 investments into emerging managers these are typically fund twos ranging from 50 to 100 million dollars yeah, yeah, yeah so so yes and no we also do first time funds okay. we also do first time small funds i think for us what we do how we think about portfolio construction on the venture side is that eight so 80 percent or 75 percent is established mm-hmm. that should bring alpha right but it also should bring Stability, right? <laughs> and then we have twenty percent or twenty five percent to uh, create outlier returns. So we're we're willing to take on more risk there, but we want to see real alpha, real value creation there. And we typically find real alpha, real value creation in three types of emerging managers. So either it is a spin out, solo GP spin out, team spin out. People who are really good investors, really good venture capitalists, who want to build their own thing or want to do their own thing. The second thing we see are thematic experts. So people who have, and these are often, very often, these are people who come from academia. So uh, who have a PhD in a certain field from the top universities, have started building things themselves, have seen things in passing, have maybe gone to a fund and started investing there, or maybe not even and immediately gone solo, but are super vertical specific, so very technological sound. And the third thing we see is people who have often been in venture for some time and want to do something different. So they have created a thesis that by then often people don't believe yet, but sometimes ends, ends up to be true. And 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 uh, whether that is aligning GPLP incentives or building indices or creating proprietary X's in one way or another, or doing structured deals at C, whatever it is, we're curious to learn more about it because we feel that there's real alpha there. I mean, the game is continuously being reinvented, and uh, and 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 so those are the three type of emerging managers that we are on the on the lookout for. I want to touch on the last one, which are folks who've been in venture for a while but want to invent something new. Are there things you've seen in the past couple of years or so? Like, what's one thing that's like stood out to you in terms of being unique and against the grain? So this is a very European example, but I think Seed Camp mm-hmm. uh, is a good example in Europe. Right? I think when they set out fifteen years or something ago uh, with a spray and pray model, <laughs> I think people, especially in Europe. Thought they were a bit crazy, right? Uh, and uh, doing a hundred investments out of a hundred million funds didn't make a lot of sense back then. Yeah. Um, and I think they've proven the market wrong, right? They're a phenomenal fund. They have stellar returns. They're in the likes of Transferwise, Revolut, UiPath, right? All of the big. Comp- they basically haven't missed many of the big companies that have emerged in Europe over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And they've done that through creating a very differentiated strategy and building a really good brand on top of that. And so that game has been played um, over a decade ago. And I think what is our job and what makes our job interesting is thinking about what is what is the seed camp model of today, right? What what will what will be the model that is going to change venture now? I, we went off script so many times in this conversation, and oh, there's enough for you in there. 
to do an, an actual episode for that. I think, well, I mean, our, our listeners can fact check me here, but there are so many good nuggets in here. And I mean, we'll, de- we'll definitely have to like round you out for another episode. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to have this conversation. I know you're in a lot of places. You're on LinkedIn. You're, you know, you write on Medium. You have your email address out there. But of all the places out there, what is the best place for people to find you? I think on LinkedIn is a pretty good place. I don't do Twitter. Uh, I don't do Instagram. <laughs> you, I will say, I I tried to find your Instagram, couldn't find it. But I have found your, your, your jacket company's Instagram. And through that... Yeah. Uh, through that, I, I saw pictures of you, and who knows, we might in the, the, the edits add some pictures throughout this episode of you through that with your permission. Um, but yeah, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. Right. Um, and we'll see you on the flip side. Cheers. Much appreciated. There's only two things you need to do in life. Know something about something and do your fucking job. Hello, Super Clusters fans. You've seen the logo at the beginning, and now we're here to address the elephant in the room. And the big question is, how intertwined is Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator? And the truth is, Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator are two completely separate entities. Other than the fact that it is only I, David, your host, who is able to traverse between the multiverses. And so the reason Alchemist is a sponsor for Superclusters is the same reason why I ended up joining Alchemist. Um, And it's for two reasons, the team and the product. So let me elaborate a little bit. For the team side, I was doing a bunch of diligence, homework, reference checks before I joined Alchemist. And I stumbled across a story which was between Ravi and an early team member of Alchemist. Um, And for the sake of this story, I'm going to call that person John. So Ravi and John were working late at night because they had a deadline coming up. And as they were about to leave, Ravi found out that John didn't have a place to stay and had been sleeping out of his car the entire time. And the next thing Ravi did literally blew my mind, which was... Ravi gave the keys to his place to John and said, John, you're free to stay here for as long as you want. And I knew instantly that this is the team I wanted to join. This is the the, the culture I wanted to be a part of. Um, The second thing is the product itself. Uh, Alchemist has built this really robust product called The Vault. And it is the epitome of Peter Drucker's infamous line, which is you cannot manage what you don't measure. And so for the uninitiated, what is Alchemist Accelerator? Alchemist Accelerator is your startup accelerator for companies that monetize from enterprises. And so don't take it just from me. Uh, We've backed incredible companies, including names you've heard of, LaunchDarkly, Prevacera, MoEngage, and we're also backed by some incredible LPs and investors, including Coastal Ventures, Mayfield, Salesforce. And now, between you and I, I can't share any of the numbers, and If I do, my compliance officer, our compliance officer, will literally gobble me up for breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, and dinner. And personally, I'm too young to die. And, but I will say, the numbers, they're great. Like, they're really great. And so if you're curious and want to get involved in Alchemist um, and the ecosystem, check out alchemistaccelerator.com backslash superclusters. And that's superclusters with an S at the beginning and at the S at the end. And we'll also include these links in the notes. Hey, Super Clusters fans, this is David from Post and want to share a few things before you go. If you're tuning in from the YouTube universe, and if you like this episode and you want to see more of it, consider subscribing. It's free. Let us know down in the comments which LPs you'd want to see next or topics you liked and want to hear more of. If you're tuning in from the audio universe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever content finds your ear, and you like what you heard, give us a follow And lastly, want to share a quick disclaimer from our legal friends. While I am the head of investor relations at Alchemist Accelerator, and that Alchemist Accelerator is one of our proud sponsors, the views expressed in this episode are for informational purposes only and are solely the views of myself and the guest alone. They are not representative of Alchemist Accelerator. None of the views expressed herein constitute legal, investment, business, or tax advice, and any allusions or references to funds or companies are purely for illustrative purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment recommendations. Consult a professional investment advisor near you prior to making any investment decisions. And that's all from me. See you on the next.